Thank you for joining us for Palm Sunday here at Snyder. We're glad that you're here. There's a lot of places you could have chosen to be this morning, but you chose to be here, so we don't take that lightly. We are in the middle, like smack dab in the middle of our Easter series. Uh, three series of talks, or talk uh, a series of three talks. This is number two, and if you think of this series, really think of it as one long sermon. But not all of it today, just one point today. Last week, we talked about the unexpected Jesus. And what we discovered that is quite unexpected about him is that you can be in close proximity to Jesus and not share his passion. We looked at an individual named Judas who spent three years shoulder to shoulder with Jesus, with Peter, with with Thomas, with Thaddeus, with James and John, right there with them, seeing everything that they saw, very close proximity to Jesus, but not sharing a passion with Jesus. And despite that, Jesus showed him, showed Judas this, this unexpected kindness. Well, today we're going to look at something that I think you might find even more unexpected about Jesus. It's unexpected for us. And that is this, that that we can understand who Jesus is. Like you can know who Jesus is and have the wrong expectations of Jesus and have the wrong expectations for Jesus. And I know some of us, some of us this morning, we're kind of Bible scholars or maybe we're kind of theologians. We think, oh, no, no, no. If you have the right understanding of Jesus, you're going to have the right expectations of Jesus. Well, one of his closest followers, many would say one of his two closest followers, like his two best friends, one of his two best friends, a guy named Peter, absolutely understood who Jesus was. But he had expectations for Jesus that were wrong. And we're going to look at that today. Now, I want you to think about something as we dive into a conversation. By the way, it's one of the most important conversations, if not the most important conversation you can ever have. We're going to dive into that conversation that Matthew remembers in just a moment. But in the middle of this conversation, there is an incredible compliment that Jesus plays pays Peter. And so I want you to think for just one moment about one of the best compliments that you've ever received. Just just think about it. I I have I have two in my life that the two kind of kind of life shaping compliments that I got when I was very young, when I was in high school. I I don't share them publicly. I, I, I don't share them at all. They're a little embarrassing, but boy, they really made my my spine straighten up and made me stand a little bit taller, made me begin to believe in myself a little bit more. Maybe you had one of those compliments when you were young. Maybe you had one of those compliments this past week. What we're about to see is that Peter had one of those compliments. And it takes place in a conversation that we looked at last August. And it's this, and we won't go through it all, but they're having this conversation. And I said, hey, this is one of the most important conversations that you'll ever have. And embedded in this conversation is the most important question that you will ever handle. The most important question that you'll ever handle. Jesus asked this question, and it sounds like kind of a selfish question, but for Jesus, because of who he was and who he was talking to, he had the people's best interest at heart who were in this conversation, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And this guy named Simon, at the time his name is Simon, he speaks up and he says, you are Christ, you're the Messiah, You're the son of the living God. And then the next thing that happens is that Jesus agrees with him. Jesus says, you're right, I'm the Messiah. You're right, I'm the son of the living God. And he begins to pour out this compliment on Peter that's astounding. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Man, you you have incredible spiritual insight, Peter. You you didn't get this on your own. You are connected to God in a special way. And he says, I tell you, you're not Simon anymore. You're Peter. You are the rock. Peter is the word, is the Greek word for, it's, it's Petros. And so you see how we just translate it over or transliterate it over into English. Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, that word church, we think church, we hear church, we think, you know, we think 
here's the church, here's the steeple, open up all the people. That's really not what Jesus is talking about at that point. I know, I know, I've studied this too. Whenever I hear church in my mind, I think little white church, you know, steeple, a couple of columns out front. That's not what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about this gathering, this movement, these people that would belong to him and move the kingdom of God forward. And he's just made Simon changed his name to Peter. He's just made him the foundation of it. And he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You're leading this thing. You're the foundation, Peter, because of what you've said. That kind of confession is what this whole movement is going to be built on. But then he goes further, and he begins to give Peter authority and responsibility. Or say it this way, he gives Peter responsibility And he gives him the authority to do it. Watch what he says. He says, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This is a a term that was used to, to denote like he was, like this was what a ruler would have. They're not literal keys, but they're symbolic of the power that Peter now has. And he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And that's, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I don't know what kind of personality Peter had, but depending on the type of person he was, his head either swelled to the size of a grapefruit on a toothpick at this point, or he felt like the weight of an African elephant had been laid on his back because he is now responsible. And not only is he responsible, the other 11 disciples, there were 12 of them, the other 11 disciples are believing the same thing that Peter said. And that's what makes this next statement in this conversation so very unexpected. Jesus says, don't tell anybody I'm Messiah. He strictly charges his disciples to tell no one that he was Christ. Matthew, the guy writing this, he was there. He remembers this. I look at this and I go, are, are you kidding me? Don't, don't tell anybody that you're Jesus? I mean, that's what I, I was raised at First Baptist, Dothan, Alabama, and my youth minister told me that we were supposed to tell everyone that Jesus was Lord, that Jesus was the Son of God. That's, that's what we were told. That's what we were supposed to do. And now, now I'm, I'm reading like primary source document here, and Jesus is saying, Shh, I'm, I'm, I'm God's son, but shh, don't, don't tell anybody. What's going on here? Let me tell you what's going on. They understood who Jesus was. They understood that Jesus was the Messiah. But they had the wrong expectations for him. They understood that he was the Son of God, but they had the wrong expectations for him. They had been handed a script from generation to generation that this guy, that the Christ, would do three things for them, that he would restore the national pride, he would restore the military power, and he would bring financial prosperity or material prosperity. These are the things that they're looking for. They're looking for the the country restored to the days of the glory of David and Solomon. They're looking for military power, and they're looking for materialistic prosperity. And that's why John, I mean, Matthew remembers this. He says, from that time, like from the moment that Peter says this, Jesus begins to show, not tell, he begins to show. And this was Jesus' practice. He begins to teach his disciples and show them in the Old Testament what the Messiah was really supposed to look like. He begins to attempt to correct the miss and wrong expectations that his disciples have of the Messiah. And he tells them along the way that he is going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And he is going to be killed. And on the third day, he'll rise. Now, they probably, they probably don't stay around mentally for any of this right here. Because when they say this, when he says this, they're kind of saying, no, 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 we can't go to Jerusalem. Peter, chief among them, saying, we can't go to Jerusalem because if we go to Jerusalem, they will do this to you. It'll go badly for us. And Jesus, you're the Messiah, and you're like David, so do what David did. Hide out in the country until you can build up the military power. Then you go into Jerusalem. Not yet, though. And so Peter, because he's the rock, because he's the foundation of the movement that Jesus has started, he respectfully pulls Jesus aside and he says, listen, you can't do this, Lord. Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. We're not going in. 
And then Jesus looks at Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but you're setting the th mind on the things of man. You understand who I am, Peter, but you have the wrong expectation for me. Can you imagine what's going on in Peter's mind and in his heart at this point? He's looking at Jesus and going, I'm not Satan, I'm the rock. I'm, I'm not a hindrance to you. I'm the foundation of what you're, you're doing. You're telling me I don't have the things of God in mind. You just told me, you just told me that, that I had incredible spiritual insight. That the flesh and blood didn't reveal this to me. And now you're, now you're telling me I don't even have those things in mind? But Peter had these expectations of Jesus, and they had to be corrected. And so Jesus begins to do what God does and what Jesus does. He begins to chip away at the rock that is Simon to create the rock that is Peter. He chips away those expectations. And Peter follows him to Jerusalem. Absolutely follows him to Jerusalem. Follows him on that day that we celebrated with the kids and the palm branches when the whole city is in an uproar and everybody knows that Jesus has come in. Peter is in that bunch and he is shoulder to shoulder with Jesus going in. And then Thursday night they share one of the most meaningful meals they'll ever have in their life. They, they, they share the Passover meal. But in that Passover meal, Jesus does several things. Among them, he, he changes the script to the Passover meal. And we'll talk about that Thursday night here at the Monday Thursday service. But another thing happens. Jesus begins, and we talked about this last week, Jesus begins to wipe and clean, wash his disciples' feet. And he gets to Peter, and Peter, see, Peter knows who Jesus is. So when, when Jesus gets to Peter, Peter says, you're not washing my feet. Because that's not what the Messiah does. That's not what King David does. That's not what you as a son of David does. You don't do that. Not to me. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. And then Peter says, okay, well, they're not my feet. Wash my hands and my whole body. And Jesus says, no, your feet will be enough. That'll be enough. And, and they go from this place missing one disciple who has now become a traitor. And they go into a garden where Jesus often goes to pray and to contemplate, and he is troubled. And those that are close to him, like Peter and John, see this. And, and, and Jesus knows that Judas has kicked over the wheel that is going to crush him. So he gives his disciples a warning. He gives them a heads up. As they're standing there. This is also from the book of Matthew. Matthew is, is there. He remembers this to us. And he says, Jesus said to them, All of you will fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd. See, he's doing what he's been doing since Peter recognized them. He is showing them from the Old Testament what the Messiah is supposed to look like. The biblical Messiah. Not this nationalistic pride. Not this military power. Not this materialistic prosperity. No, no, that's not it. He is going to be struck down and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after, and they, they don't hear this. Because they're lost over in this. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter's having none of this. And Peter says, I don't know about the rest of these guys. They may all fall away because of you, but I never will. I'm, I'm all in until the end, Jesus. I'm not falling away. And Jesus, please understand this. Peter loved Jesus, and Jesus loved Peter. They were committed to one another. Peter understood who Jesus was, that he was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. He, just, he had expectations that Jesus didn't share. He had wrong expectations, so Jesus looks at Peter and sternly says, Truly, let's talk truth here, Peter. I tell you, this very night, before the, before the sun comes up in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. You're not just abandoning me. You're going to deny that you even know me. 
And Peter says, oh, no, 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 not me. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. I'm all in until the end, Jesus. And all the other disciples, they're saying the same thing. We're all in till the end, Jesus. We're not going to deny you. We're not going to abandon you. And we are not going to give up. We're not going to run away. But in the midst of this, Judas's wheel is turning and is gaining momentum. And the chief priest and the scribes and the Pharisees and their soldiers roll up in this tranquil scene of the garden. And they begin to initiate the arresting of Jesus, the binding and the taking away of Jesus. And Peter, Peter was not kidding around when he said, I will fight to the death for you. And so what Peter does when they roll up on his Savior, when they roll up on the man that they, he knows is the Messiah, he has a sword. It's a sword, by the way, if you read the scriptures, that Jesus made sure that he had. And so Peter pulls the sword. He draws the sword. He strikes the high priest service. He's ready to rumble. And he's thinking everybody else is going to fall in behind him. They're going to fight these guys off. And he goes for the closest person to him, the servant of the high priest. He probably wishes he could get to the high priest, but he goes to the servant. And we read this so many times and we think, man, that's really, really precision work there, Peter, cutting that guy's ear off. Cut your ear off. You come back, I'll cut your other ear off. It's not that at all. The guy, Peter is going for this guy's throat. And the guy dodges and he slices his ear off. And it's on. You think, man, now it's on. And Jesus says, put up your sword. He actually heals the guy's ear, puts it back on his head. And he says, Peter, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Peter, don't you understand? This is not about your expectations for the Messiah. It's about God's will for me. I am not going to submit to your expectations for me. I am submitted and surrendered to the will of the Father here. But you see, Peter loved Jesus. And Jesus loved Peter. And so Peter does what Jesus says, but you've got to be wondering at this point the cognitive distance and dissonance and the, the emotional turmoil that Peter is feeling at this point. You're the rock. You're Satan. I'm not going to let you wash my feet. I have to wash your feet. You're going to deny me. No, I'm not. I'm going to fight to the death for you. Here's my sword. I'm fighting for you. Put it up. It's got to be confusing, and, and, and what's happening in all of this is that he's being chipped away at. Those expectations are being chipped away. See, some of us that, that have followed Jesus long enough, you know what this feels like, right? You know he's God, but you've got certain expectations in your life for God. You've got this script that you know that God's going to follow for you. He's going to bless you in this way, and he's going to bless you in another way. Because you're going to do what he says, and then he's going to do what you expect. And what that creates for us, and what it created for Peter in this moment, is it, create, it created frustration. Some of us sometimes, we are so frustrated in our relationship with God because we have these expectations of him that, that don't ally, align with his expectations. He's, he's not sitting on his throne to achieve our expectations. He's sitting on the throne to do the will of God. And he submits to God's will in this moment. But please remember, Peter loves Jesus. So you know what? The other nine that are left, there's 11 left, nine of them, they run. They take off. They head for the hills. They hide in the bushes. But they're not there. But there are two of them that keep following Jesus even after his arrest. And that is, that is Peter followed Jesus and the other disciples were now moved to the gospel of John or the good news account of John. John is another eyewitness to these events. 
And not only is he witness to him, he is in him. Whenever you read these phrases in John's good news account, other disciple or beloved disciple or the disciple that Jesus loved, John is referring to himself. I think he's trying to be humble. I don't know if he pulls it off or not. But anyway, he is the other disciple. So that disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, this place where Jesus is going to go through this kangaroo court, this mock kind of trial. And so he, he gets to go in. And Peter has to stay outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So now they're both inside the house. Peter's still kind of in this out at this inner court and Jesus inside getting tried. But as he walks in the door, and John's with Jesus, but as Peter walks in the door, the servant girl says, you also are not one of his man, this man's disciples, are you? And John says that he said, I am not. Later on, Peter would spend time talking with Matthew as Matthew wrote his account of this event. Obviously, John is focused on Jesus at this time and in this moment. So John talks with Peter, and Peter says, this is what I really said in that moment. This is, John, this is Matthew's gospel, Matthew 26, 70. He says, I told him I didn't know what they were talking about. He, he looks at this little girl and says, I don't know what you mean. Now, the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire, and because it was cold, they were standing, warming themselves. And Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. And then John skips a bit in, of what's going on in Peter's life and, and, and goes back to the real context of the message of his good news account, this, this trial that's taking place where Jesus is being maligned and physically abused and mentally abused. He talks about that, and then he cuts back in a moment to Peter. And he says, Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he said that he denied it. He later tells Matthew, he said, I denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. He took an oath. I don't know the man. And one of his servants, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative, like a cousin of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. Looks, looks at Peter and says, didn't I see you in the garden with him? I mean, like, aren't you the guy that tried to cut the neck of my cousin? And Peter says, no, I'm not. Peter later talks to Matthew and he tells him, this is what really happened, Matthew. I began to curse I began to evoke a curse on myself and to swear, and I said, I don't know the man. And it was at this moment that another good news writer, a guy named Luke, remembers that Jesus looked through a doorway out into that inner courtyard and he caught the eyes of Peter. And the Lord turned and he looked at Peter and then it came crashing down on Peter. He remembered everything that Jesus had said to them. I think sometimes when we read this verse and we, we read what happened, that, that, that Peter denied him. And, and understand, Jesus looks at him while the rooster is crowing when the sun is about to come up. And while Peter is still using this profane language, Jesus' eyes catches Peter's eyes. And I don't for a moment think that... that that he looks at Peter with this, I told you so, kind of look. They were friends. Jesus loved him. He, he just was chipping away at those expectations that Peter had exalted above the will of God. We're all going to be tempted to do that from time to time. We're all going to be put in this place where, where we want to 
put our expectations above the will of God. It's a very frustrating place to be. Like right now, I, I just wonder if there's someone here and you have been wrestling for some time with something like this. And, and maybe, it's not even, maybe it's not even something that God wants, that you want God to do for you. It's, it's what God wants you to do for him. Like you've got, your, you've got your whole life kind of mapped out for you, but you feel him tugging and leading you to do something more or something other than. And, it, and it's hard. Probably not as hard as going to Jerusalem, but it's hard. It, it, might, be, it might be that, that, that right now in, in your life there's a family member and you are distant and you are disconnected from them and you know, you know that's not God's will. You absolutely know that's not God's will. And everybody else around you, the expectation is, hey, she did that or he did that, and they deserve this and they deserve that. So, so I'm, I'm not going to extend kindness. Yeah, those are expectations, but I, I don't think that's what God wants. And maybe he is calling you to something. Maybe it's time for you to do something other than what you're doing to volunteer in this church, or maybe even consider a different career because you've got this intelligence and you've got this passion around something. Or maybe this story hits you a little bit differently this morning. Maybe it hits you this way. You look at Peter and you hear him swearing and taking oaths and saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know the man. And you're looking at your own heart this morning and you're going, oh my, that's me. I've denied him. I've chosen a different way because I had different expectations. See what Peter did? He, he ran out and started crying. And at that point, he could have lived a life of remorse. He, he could have, he, this could be another tragic ending to a tragic story, but that's not the way it turned out. Yeah, it broke his heart. There's certain traditions in the Christian tradition that teach us that, that Peter would always cry when he thought back to this night. So much so that, that he had marks in his cheeks from crying so much and so often. Because, see, Peter loved Jesus. But he didn't stay in the remorse. See, last week we talked about a guy who traded Jesus out. And when he realized what he had done, that man named Judas, he returned to his co-conspirators. But his co-conspirators had nothing. He couldn't fix what he had done. And they wouldn't fix what he would done. He had done. Peter, he slowly begins to remo move back to Jesus over the course of the next few hours. He finds his friends. And he comes and he gets back to them, with them. But I want you to see something. The oldest account, the oldest historical document we have of Jesus' resurrection is from a gospel writer, a good news a writer named Matthew. I mean, named Mark. The ladies, there were these ladies that came to, to take care of the tomb early Sunday morning. We'll pick up right here next week. But not before we see one thing. They, they see that Jesus is not there. The tomb's rolled away and there's this kind of celestial being that's sitting there in the tomb and he speaks to the ladies and he says, do not be alarmed. I know who you're looking for. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Come on, look in here. You can see the place where he laid. they laid him. But go tell his disciples... And Peter. 
the compliment's still in effect. He's still the rock, y'all. Jesus looks at the guy who denied him three times and says, you're the rock. That's my design for you. I've just got to chip away sometimes because you've got these expectations that don't line up with God's will. But you know who I am. That he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. I had a pastor named Jim Dennison for, for years in, in Atlanta. And Jim, he has this phrase, and he uses it in different ways, but, but his phrase is this. He says, what God allows, God will redeem. And so this morning, if you're, if you're here this morning, you're thinking, man, I have, you know, I have not been the follower of Jesus I need to be. Maybe I haven't denied him, but I haven't been walking as closely. You know what he looks at when he sees you? He sees a child of God. And he wants you to know that, that whatever he allows, and whatever's happened to you, he will redeem. And next Sunday, that's where we pick up the redemption and the restoration that God wants to work in your life and in mine but it's available for you this morning, like right now. So if you've never given your life to Jesus to follow him, I pray that you would do that this morning. The person that you brought, that brought you, that you came with, they can tell you how to do that. And if you came by yourself, that's why I'm here. That's why Susie's here. We'll be right here. I'm going to stand here while the band sings in just a moment on the floor to talk to you. And if you're thinking... If you're thinking that you want a church where people are running hard after Jesus, that's what Peter does after he finds out this. He runs hard after Jesus. And, and we get to talk about that next week. But if you're looking for some, a group of people that are running hard after Jesus, you don't need to look any further. We'd be glad to be your church. We believe that you'd help us run harder and faster and farther toward Jesus. And we'll certainly help you do that as well. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this unexpected kindness and love and restoration that you show to Jesus. I mean, show to Peter, that you show to us. And so, Father, today as, as we look at Peter and we look at all of his expectations that he had for you and how often he got it wrong, but the whole time you were just chipping away with him, chipping away at him, making him more and more the rock, redeeming what you allowed, redeeming those things that Peter would otherwise regretted and led him to remorse, but it led to his repentance. And so, Father, I pray that would be true of us this morning. And so that person here this morning that just simply needs to maybe not so much ask you to do something for them, but you're asking them to do something for you. To forgive the person that's hurt them or maybe even to step into another career and begin to follow you by doing something differently. Because you've given them certain gifts and certain talents to move your kingdom forward. God, for the individual today that, that, that did not know that there is a Jesus that loves them so much, that doesn't look at them through a doorway and say, I told you so, you're disgusting, but looks at them through a doorway and says, I love you so much. Lord, I pray that we receive that love today, and that we would walk in it. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing. I'm down here front to talk down front to talk with you. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>